Welcome to Biotechnology and the Emergence of New Therapeutics. This is the fourth in our Science in the News Fall Seminar Series, and we're glad you trudged through the horrible weather to make it here tonight. Um, we are Science in the News, a graduate student organization at the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences here at Harvard. I'm Tammy, and this is Amy, and together we are co-directors of the organization. So Science in the News is focused on communicating science to you guys, our community, the general public. Um, you don't have to be a scientist to come here. In fact, we welcome people of all backgrounds, and we try to make our seminars accessible to everyone. Um, in addition to our seminar series, we also have a couple other programs, one of which is Science by the Pint which is where we bring a group of scientists, usually one featured scientist who's a Harvard or MIT faculty member, and their lab members who mingle from group to group at the bar and chat with you about their work. We're pleased to announce that Science by the Pint is resuming in November. We're starting on November 12th. And we'll have the advertisements next week with the featured scientists' information. We're scheduled for three months right now at the Burren in Davis Square. And we'd love for you guys to come out and provide feedback on the new venue so we can decide whether we're going to keep going there or change it up again. In addition to Science by the Pint and our lecture series, we have a bi-weekly newsletter, the Science in the News Flash, which features current science topics again, geared toward a general public audience. It does not require a lot of science background. Finally, we do enter the classroom in a number of ways to reach a younger audience. And if you have questions about our education outreach programs, you can talk to Amy or me at the break or at the end of the talk. So I'll turn it over to Amy to explain the format for tonight's seminar. Hi, everyone. One note about Science by the Pints, so the first one is going to be about how what you eat or what you don't eat before surgery affects the outcomes. All right, so on to the lectures. Uh, we have three speakers here tonight. They're all graduate students at Harvard. And each of them is going to be speaking for uh, 20 to 30 minutes. And during this time, uh, they'll pause for questions. And we really uh, ask that you um, ask away whatever you're wondering about. What we have now are these mics. Since we're streaming live now, we really want to pick up as many of the questions as possible by mic. So um, while the question is being asked and answered, uh, just have your hand up. And one of us will come up or down these aisles uh, to hand you the mic. And then the speakers will keep an eye out for whoever has the mics um, and call on those people to talk next. Um, so we'll have uh, one talk, uh, pause for questions, then the second talk, and a 10-minute break during which you can come down, um, chat with the speakers, talk with us, and uh, get more food. And then there will be the third speaker. And at the end, if you're interested, there's a lab tour of George Church's lab, which is where Dima works. And there's space for there's space for 20 people uh, for the lab tour. So during the break, come down and sign up on this sheet of paper uh, if you'd like to go. And it'll leave about 10 minutes after the lectures end. The other thing that we ask you to do is please, please fill out one of these surveys. Um, we take them very seriously. We compile the results, 
and send them to our speakers so they know what they did well, what they can improve on. It also helps us know how we can improve the lecture series and um, hold us accountable to our sponsors. Um, so uh, with that, let me turn it over to Tammy to thank our sponsors. Okay, as Amy said, we have we provide this to you free tonight, but it's actually subsidized by quite a few people here at Harvard. Uh, we are, as I said, a graduate student organization at the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences, and we are funded by the Graduate Student Council. We're also supported generous, generously by Harvard Medical School, specifically by the Office of Communications and External Affairs and the Division of Medical Sciences, as well as the Biomedical Graduate Student Organization and Harvard Harvard's Coop, which is the bookstore here at Harvard some of you might be familiar with. So we thank our sponsors. And also, before I turn it over to our three wonderful speakers tonight, I ask you to please pull out your phones and silence them. The room is mic'd. It will pick up phones and disturb the people around you, the video, and the live stream. So we thank you all for coming. And I'll turn it over to Dima to start tonight's lecture. Hi, everyone. Hope you're all excited to be a part of today's Science in the News lecture on biotechnology and the emergence of new therapeutics. My name is Vinny, and I'm a first year student in the immunology program here at Harvard. Prior to coming here, I spent some time during undergrad uh, working at biotech companies in uh, the research and development as well as the marketing department. So I learned quite a bit in that process. I'm very passionate about becoming a bio entrepreneur myself someday. So I'm excited to be here to speak with you on this topic overview of what we'll be discussing today. Um, my portion of the talk will cover what it takes to make a drug. And uh, actually, Kat's portion of the talk will also be uh, covering uh, current methods in drug discovery. And Dima will be speaking about the emergence of new therapeutics, such as gene therapy and RNA interference. So to start off, can anybody tell me what a therapeutic or drug is? Anyone? Like a drug that helps you cure an illness. All right. Something that helps you cure an illness. Perfect. So a little bit more of a technical definition would be that a therapeutic is something that is chemical or biological that's used in the treatment, cure, or even prevention of a disease. And so uh, for today's talk, to simplify things, we're going to be using therapeutic and drug interchangeably. So make sure not to get confused. So here are some examples of therapeutics that you see today. This is azithromycin, which is actually an antibiotic that's used to treat strep throat. Albuterol, which is an inhaled steroid for uh, treatment of asthma. Aspirin, which many of you may know. And these are all kind of classified as chemical drugs. Now, on this side, we have insulin over here, which is actually a protein therapeutic. And I'll talk a little bit more about ro what proteins are later. So insulin is uh, used to treat diabetes. And we also have this emerging class of stem cells, which many of you may heard of, have heard of in the news. So these are all kind of classified as biological therapeutics. So to give you a kind of progression of how these have evolved over time, let's look at a historical perspective. So in ancient times, people used to chew on willow bark, actually, um, because they observed it had a medicinal and pain-relieving effect. And in the 1800s, it was then discovered that this willow bark contains something called salicylic acid, which is what aspirin is made from today. And then we quickly moved into this arena of biological substances. So in the 1920s, the protein insulin was actually um, taken from an ox's pancreas. And this was then purified and injected into children to effectively treat their diabetes. And then we moved further along quickly to uh, using cells themselves for therapy. And cells are the small structures that make up our bodies, and they come in very specialized forms. So in the 1950s, what happened was there was an accident at a nuclear plant in Europe, which caused radiation to affect the workers at the plant. So what a French oncologist did was he actually transplanted bone marrow as a therapeutic for these workers. And today, it's also widely used in leukemia treatment. And then moving on to a little bit more of an advanced technology, you guys may have all heard of gene therapy. And genes are actually something that hold the information to build and maintain an organism, cells, and pass genetic traits on to an offspring. 
And if anything happens, if they get damaged, and uh, genetic diseases can arise. And this image over here kind of shows you a piece of undamaged DNA being inserted into a cell by a virus, which Dima will talk more about. And this is to treat immunodeficiency in a young girl. So let's just point out here uh, from the overall picture that there's kind of this beautiful progression of therapeutics from something that just happened to be with the willow bark. And uh, it kind of has grown from to really mapping the biological basis of drug design. So with things like gene therapy, they define a, high, a higher level of understanding of biology. And to give you a little bit of a basic overview on what this means, um, I'm going to talk to you a bit about the central dogma. So the central dogma is the basic principle that there's something, there's information for functions encoded in something called the DNA. And the DNA inside every cell of your body contains all of the information necessary for life. You want to keep this safe from harm. So to create a function that is a part of the DNA is actually photocopied and made into a copy in RNA, which then codes for a particular protein. And the protein is what performs the function within your body. So an important point of relevance for us today is actually to note that when you change something in your DNA, that change gets carried over to the RNA and then again to the protein. So if we're looking at um, the genetic basis of disease, so in diseases, if you have something going wrong in your DNA, this carries over to a defect in your protein. But we can also use this to our advantage in basic therapeutics by changing the DNA ourselves. And this is something that Kat and Dima will talk a little bit more about. But for now, I want to focus a little bit more on proteins. So as I mentioned before, proteins have many functions in the body. They can catalyze reactions and maintain the structure and metabolism of a cell and very many more functions. So here are some examples of proteins that you may have heard about. This is collagen. Collagen is a structural protein that kind of holds things in your body together. And then we have something a little bit more complicated. This is HMG-CoA reductase, and this is what's called an enzyme. An enzyme is something that catalyzes a reaction, so it makes something occur. And this is what actually makes cholesterol. But what happens when these things go wrong? So a lack of a protein or a particular defect in a protein structure or function can cause disease. And a defect can mean uh, the protein is doing too much, too little, or is just not doing the right thing. So to remedy this, you can actually replace the defective protein or find a way to change its function. So when we're trying to replace a protein, we can uh, actually inject it. So in the example of collagen, if collagen, which is the purple blob over there, is damaged by UV light, uh, you see that it kind of changes its structure and has some mutations in there. But then when you inject collagen into a person who has damaged collagen, they become happy. So that's pretty easy to follow. Now, when you're looking into changing a protein's function, which is really what has been focused on in the biotech industry, they use something called small molecule drugs. And small molecule drugs are called as such because they're at scale that where they can bind to proteins to change their function. So let's go back to this HMG co-reductase um, protein that we were talking about earlier and zoom in a little bit. So that small structure that you see in there is actually a small molecule drug that has bound. Now, to help you understand this a little bit better, I'm going to use myself as a prop. So if I'm a protein, if I'm HMGCR, right, and my function is to make cholesterol, so I'm using my hands, and I have my free hands to be able to make cholesterol. But if a small molecule binds to me in a certain place, my arms actually come together, and I can't move them in order to make cholesterol. And this is an example of something that an inhibitory drug would do. And I'll talk a little bit more about this later. So some of the sources of these small molecule drugs are either natural or can be made in a lab. So we talked about how willow bark contained the precursor for aspirin. So there are a lot of natural sources that you could use. And it's also possible to synthesize these in the lab. And this is through a process called chemical synthesis, which we'll talk a little bit more about in the second portion of today's talk. So before I move on, I wanted to take any questions that you might have. I know that's quite a bit to cover. Do you include um, mechanical means for remedying disease, such as nanostructures? 
Yeah. Because it's not in chemical or biological. Yeah, so that's actually um, a little bit more complex okay. in that, um, I mean, those definitely do exist, but for the purpose of today's talk, to simplify it. But that's a very good question. Uh, wonderful talk, thank you. You know, just, uh, you know, on the semantics or the vocabulary, you know, um, in this country, we use chemicals and biologic, B I O. L O G I C. Yep. We can add an S. Uh, the reason I, you know, kind of pick you on this is, you know, uh, at the FDA, they use the term, you know, Center for Biologics Evaluation and Research. They right. consider. Yeah. And so they don't use the biological unless you add a product at the end. So you can say, oh, we have chemicals and biological products. Exactly. So, I mean, um, to bring up that point, so uh, I didn't want to use biologics because that defines an entirely kind of, it defines a particular class of drug, and we kind of want to keep this a little bit more general. And I think Kat will talk a little bit more about biologics uh, as well. But that, thanks for bringing that point up. All right. So, there aren't any more questions. I'm going to move on to the second part of this talk. So basically, I want to tell you about how a drug actually gets to the market. And I'm going to dis distinct describe them in kind of five stages. So who are really the key players in this process? So to bring a therapeutic to the market, we have collaboration with the academic institutions. So places like Harvard do a lot of research that is able to um, find a particular protein that biotech companies want to work with. And then the biotechnology companies, pharmaceutical companies, they all kind of pull their efforts together to really create a drug and see it through to completion to the market. And this, is, this process is also monitored by the Food and Drug Administration, the FDA. And so within this process, you have even more players, which includes the field of medicine. When you're going through clinical trials, which I'll talk to you a little bit more about, um, the efforts of all four of these institutions coming together is really important to make the process more efficient. So to help you a little bit, I'm going to take you through an example of Lipitor. So Lipitor is probably something many of you have heard of. Lipitor is actually the best-selling drug in pharmaceutical history, which it's accumulated over $125 billion in sales since, it's, uh, since hitting the market in 1996. And the purpose of this is to lower cholesterol and heart attack risk. So let me take you a little bit through the process of drug discovery. And to give you a definition, drug discovery is the process of really finding a relevant protein and a way to change its function. So this is something that's going to be relevant to what we're talking about. So in the discovery of Lipitor, a protein, the HMGCR, which I talked about before, um, that makes cholesterol, was identified in academia. And then there was some, there's something called a statin, which is a small molecule drug that binds to HMGCR and causes a loss of function. And this was discovered at Pfizer. And overall, their goal was to prevent the production of cholesterol. And this seems like a very simple process, but there are a lot of more things to consider, and this is where drug development comes in. So in drug development, what you have is it's essentially a process of finding the optimum drug and ensuring that it can work safely in the body for the prescribed functions. So some of these considerations um, that they go through in the stage of drug development are um, making sure that it can kind of dissolve in the body so it can be taken up by your body to be used. You obviously don't want it to be toxic and you want it to be chemically stable so that it doesn't break apart and do a bunch of things that you don't want it to do. <laughs> so in the case of Lipitor, what they found was, again, they found these class of drugs called statins. And statins inhibit the function of HMGCR. And what they wanted to do in this drug development process was kind of tweak the drug to make sure it not only inhibits but also to make sure that it doesn't adversely affect other basic functions of your body, such as your heart rate and other things. So you can see in this process, they had five potential, uh, very probably more as well, but in this process, you have like five potential uh, structures that they could use for a small molecule, and they finally narrowed it down to one. So um, before I move on to clinical trials, are there any more questions? Um, one other thing I noticed is that 
when you try to test a certain drug, um, there's a lot of like, um, maybe like, because of your, like, everybody just has uh, different biological, like, bar body, I don't know, like, it's like, uh, sorry to explain. Um, can, um, how do you test out that the, the drugs really work if, if um, there are other um, factors to your body that you have to consider? That's a really good question. And it's actually very complex. So I'll touch a little bit upon this in the next portion when I'm talking a little bit about clinical trials. But um, I think for the purpose of the scope of today's talk, maybe I can talk to you later about that. Sorry. All right. All right. So let's move on to the next portion of this arrow. So the third kind of step that we're looking at is animal studies. And so, um, how animal studies work and the purpose of them is to really test if this drug gives its desired effect and is safe in, in a body. And these are conducted in labs in sets of multiple animals per trial. And at each different stage, there are different types of animals used. And this is actually kind of working hand in hand with the other part of drug development in that you can also narrow down the options through drug development so you can test multiple potential small molecules to figure out which one might work best in a human. And this process takes about three to six years. So if we look in the example of Lipitor, we take Lipitor and we inject it into an animal, and then we examine the effects overall, like overall levels and obviously levels of cholesterol because that's what we're looking to target. But we want to kind of establish a baseline so that it's safe before we take it into the inhuman studies. So in the human studies, we kind of call these things clinical trials. And this is arguably the most intensive part of bringing a therapeutic to the market. And it requires, again, the cooperation of biotechnology industry, mm -hmm. FDA, and the field of medicine to really be successful. So let me walk you through a few of the phases of the human clinical trials. So we generally break it up into three phases. In phase one, the point is to really find if the drug is safe or not. And in phase two is where all of the dosage guidelines are established and you find out if the drug is efficient and it's doing what it needs to do within the body. And then in phase three, they take a little bit more of a long-term look um, over three years, which I'll talk a little bit more about, to find out, uh, to make sure there aren't too many side effects um, when you're putting these things into humans. So let me cover a little bit of the basics of clinical trials before I go into each of the steps. So clinical trials are obviously conducted in a hospital setting with the assistance of physicians as well. And there are two really main things to consider in clinical trials. One is the placebo, and the other is the fact that they're using something called a double-blind study. So a placebo is a treatment that has no medical effect for uh, basic definition. And these are used kind of to control for psychological effects. So say I'm giving out a pill. So in a clinical study, I have a placebo in one hand and I have a drug in the other hand. From the outside, they're going to look exactly the same. And this is just to eliminate any basic effect that you're going to have. And then we move to the, the double-blind studies. And double-blind studies are probably the most crucial part of this. And it's that the idea of the double-blind study is that neither the patient nor the physician will know um, who's getting the actual drug or who's getting the placebo. And this is to really control for biases. You don't want any conscious or subconscious biases in this whole process. And um, if you guys have seen episodes of House or Grey's Anatomy where people have actually tampered with the clinical trial process, this results in the clinical trial being halted and the drug never making it to the market. So it's a very touchy issue in the industry. So let me tell you a little bit about how trials work. So figuratively, let's say we have this box. And this box is half filled with drugs and half filled with placebos. They look totally the same on the outside. And then you have a bunch of patients. And they're either all healthy patients or all patients in need of, say, a cholesterol-lowering drug. So the demographic is generally the same with that. So what you do is you essentially kind of number these off, number your patients off, and then you almost draw out of a hat. But in, realist, in reality, it's done by a third party with a different computer program and whatnot. But 
if you're drawing out of a hat, you kind of randomize, and then you end up giving these drugs or the placebos to the patients. And neither the physician nor the patient knows which type of drug they're getting. So a little bit more on this. So after these patients are given these uh, drugs, once they enter the clinical trials, they're monitored and their full results are recorded and revealed after the trial. So you can see that this patient is very happy because they've had healthy weight loss, but this person is very sad because they've experienced nausea throughout this entire process, which is very unpleasant. But at this point, we still don't know who has received the placebo or the drug. So finally, when the um, drug trial concludes, we realize we actually reveal who, has, who was on the drug and who was on the placebo. And you can see with a little color coding. So it actually turns out that the patient with healthy weight loss was not on Lipitor. They were on the placebo. And the patient experiencing nausea was on the drug, which is something that they would take into consideration for further development and put going through further clinical trials. So let's dig into each phase. So the first phase of clinical trials, as I talked about before, is to really make sure that therapeutics are safe in humans. And about 100 healthy, normal patients are selected. In the case of Lipitor, these patients do not have any cholesterol, abnormal cholesterol issues. So we take them, and we either give them the drug or the placebo, and then after one or two years, you kind of monitor over the course of that time. You monitor, and then you kind of find out what the results are from there. And if it's safe enough to proceed, you go into phase two. And in phase two, what happens is you're really focusing on establishing what kind of dose you're going to administer and how efficient the drug is in patients who actually need to use the therapeutic. So in this case, you see the patients in orange, and they have high cholesterol. And so they're in the same way given either the drug or the placebo, and over the course of one or two years, they're monitored for certain effects, as we discussed before. And then finally, we get to phase three, which is um, the most crucial phase of the clinical trials. And this is where um, they can really, in the clinic, measure the long-term effects and make sure that there aren't any harmful side effects over a longer period of time. So again, you have a lot more patients here with high cholesterol in the case of Lipitor, and they're given the drug or the placebo. And at the end of three years, you can track their progression and see what kind of side effects they've accumulated and to make sure that it's still safe after that period of time. So just to kind of recap what phases we've talked about. So if we go from phase one, 75% of the drugs that actually go through phase one are able to make it through phase two. And if you get to phase two, only about 48% of them can make it to phase three. But if you're able to get past the phase three of the drug trials, about 60% of the drugs can actually make it to the market, which is a really good number. So then we can talk about FDA approval, which is kind of the final stage of this arrow that I'm talking to you about. So in FDA approval, um, this actually occurs. So the company files, the biotech company who's invented the drug, files for an FDA approval. And after the phase three of the clinical trials, it takes about one year to review and approve the drugs. And after approval, the FDA actually ends up surveying the drug on the market to make sure that there isn't anything going terribly wrong. And this is sometimes referred to as phase four, if you hear it in the news somewhere. So with Lipitor, they haven't really experienced any grave side effects since its inception in 1996. But um, this past year, actually, what happened was Lipitor was implicated in different ways in memory loss and confusion. So they kind of put that out there. But at the same time, this is in a very small population. So it wasn't too major for them. But what happens when this goes really well? So a lot of you may have heard of thalidomide. And thalidomide was a drug that was used in the uh, 60s for the prevention of morning sickness in pregnant women. And it was approved by the FDA. But after some time on the market, what they found was birth defects um, were actually appearing in the children of women who were taking thalidomide. And once the FDA observed this, they immediately pulled the drug from the market for safety. So in this whole process, there are a lot of things to think about, especially the fact that no therapeutic is perfect at all. You're always going to have some type of side effect. 
So really this process between the biotech company making a really efficient drug versus the FDA um, <coughs> looking for safety is kind of the main balance that they're looking for in the industry to bring a drug to the market. And these more conservative policies that the FDA has adopted um, has, gives a less chance of high-risk therapeutics actually making it to the market and harming, potentially harming people. So to kind of summarize a little bit, let me give you a little bit of the, the numbers. So it costs roughly about a billion dollars over a couple of decades to bring a therapeutic from its discovery to the market, which is a lot of money. And only about 8% of the drugs that are actually developed can uh, be approved in the market. And last year, actually, 35 new drugs were approved by the FDA, which is relatively high. It's one of the highest numbers in the past decade. So it's a good sign. But we also see that the global spending for therapeutics is going to be over a trillion by 2015. So you see that, obviously, it costs a lot for the companies, but it also brings in a lot of revenue. The other thing to note, and to make sure we don't kind of play off that biotech is the bad guy over here, what they do is they make sure that some of their revenue actually goes back into the R&D, and at times this can be up to 20% of just the revenue that goes back into research and development for new therapeutics to continue um, making these for people to survive. So in summary, um, we discussed that therapeutics are medically relevant chemical and biological agents, and that really the goal of drug discovery and development is to identify a particular function that you want to modify and design a therapeutic that actually meets all this criteria. And the FDA trial and approval process, which represents the tail end of bringing a drug to the market, is designed to really ensure the safety of the therapeutic on the market for everyone. And thank you for your attention. I open to any questions you may have. I read somewhere that uh, there are 100,000 Every year in the United States, there are about 100,000 hospital admissions from people who take their pharmaceuticals correctly. Is that true or is that bogus? Um, that's actually not a fact that I've heard spread around very bogus. much. I, I mean, I wouldn't brush it off as bogus because it, it could be true. But um, like we said, like there are a lot of side, side effects that, are, that occur in just a small subset of people. So even when we're talking about Lipitor. And that, that leads me to my real question. OK. When you're researching and developing a drug, what percentage of people have to, are allowed to have a negative outcome for the drug to be still sent to market? So it's actually a touchy subject with the FDA. So what the FDA does is, with the biotech company, they say, oh, it's going to work in 85% of the people. And if it, if, so they're just throwing a certain number out. Say, they can say 70 or they can say 80. So they can give a percentage of people that it's going to work in or it's going to be this effective. And, um, they map all the side effects, and if they can meet those criteria in the clinical trial, then it will likely be able to go to market unless there are severe issues. So it's generally very successful, minus like the minor side effects that you're going to have. Okay. Um, you mentioned a year after the phase three completes, so at that point all the data is in. Why does it take the FDA a year given that all the testing and all the data is in. And the second uh, part of my question is, with thalidomide, you would think that some of the tests would have shown that what was the factor that kept the, the phases from catching this uh, serious side effect? Right, so um, to address the second question first, so with, in the case of thalidomide, um, the FDA didn't have as stringent conditions as they do today. And so that phase three process was a little bit shorter. And so they weren't in the timeline to be able to detect that in very many people. But once it hit the market and it was going on for a really long time, they got to see the effects. And unfortunately, something like that happened. But fortunately for us today, they, they're using that as an experience to learn from. And then, sorry, could you repeat your first question again? And the first question was, why, after all the data is collected and all the tests are completed, does it take the FDA one year to make a decision? Right, so his question was, why does it take the FDA a whole year after this data pre presentation to really approve the drug? And 
they have their own kind of stringent conditions. Sometimes it can take less than a year, but what happens is there's still a little bit of back and forth. The FDA wants certain things, and um, there's also, um, within the FDA, they have different departments that it has to go through, so a whole bunch of specialists, and they want a little bit more like feedback. So they kind of go back to the lab a little bit to do a few more experiments if necessary. So with all of those things in consideration, it takes a long time. Could you just speak uh, briefly about the role of the physician? And specifically, are physicians charged with being aware of all ongoing tr tr drug trials and their specialty, or how does that work? So um, generally, physicians aren't um, necessary for monitoring like pretty for everything. We usually use clinicians, actually, in the setting because um, of legal restrictions. And I think um, what happens is um, within the clinic, and it depends on the type of therapeutic that you're using, but for general drugs, the clinicians don't uh, spend like every day monitoring the patient, if that was what the question was. How did they find out about it? How, how did, I mean, did, what did the Lipitor people do? Did they go out to internists or cardiac people, or how, how did that work? Yeah, so, um, yeah, actually this process is a, a little bit more complicated, so I can talk to you a little bit later, because I think we're running out of time as well, but, um, oh, huh? Oh, repeat the question. So. <laughs> <laughs> My bad. So, um, I was just wondering, um, with Lipitor, you the first stage is using healthy people, but isn't it unhealthy to have too low a level of cholesterol as well as too high? Yeah, that's a really good question. So, what they do is they make sure they administer this very, very in small doses so that it doesn't adversely affect. Um, the actual patients. And that's why this is done in a clinical setting, because if something goes wrong, then um, you're there to kind of stop the trial, regardless of, of what's happening. OK. Sorry, I can answer your question afterwards. Okay. Can you hear me? Is the mic on? Hello? Okay. Hopefully the, you can hear me now, right? Is this good? Louder? I think it's not. Okay. Is this good? How about this? Okay. It might just be the positioning, actually. How about this? No. The guy was playing with that for a while. Okay, this is better? Mm -hmm. Great. So good evening and thank you again for joining us with Science in the News. My name is Kat and I'm a fourth year graduate student in the Biological and Biomedical Sciences program here at Harvard. And my research is on the biology and treatment of brain tumors. And so I'm particularly interested in tonight's topic because in my lab, we work with pharmaceutical drugs to better understand how they work in the context of brain tumors and to hopefully offer better treatment options for brain tumor patients. So we just heard a great talk by Vinny who told us a little bit about, first of all, what is a drug and then how the drug development process works. And now I'm going to tell you a little bit about current methods in drug discovery. So I'm going to be emphasizing two classes of drugs that Vinny touched upon. The first is small molecule-based drugs, which are discovered by high-throughput screening and rational drug design. And the second is protein-based drugs, which we call biologics, which uh, are made by recombinant DNA technology. So my goal is to be able to explain and give examples of each one of these different approaches to drug design. And I will have time for some questions at the end of each section. So with that, let's begin with high-throughput screening, which is an approach to identify small molecule drugs. As Vinny told us, small molecules bind to proteins to change their function. For example, she told us about HMG-CoA receptor, and she showed us this small molecule that's binding to this protein. 
and thus in, uh, inhibiting and modulating its function. She also told us that small molecules can come from nature or can be chemically synthesized. And from these sources, there are millions and millions of small molecules that exist. In fact, there are so many of them that we often find them stored in collections called libraries. But unlike your local library that stores books, these um, libraries store small molecules and can have as many as half a million up to three million small molecules in a library. And such libraries can be found in pharmaceutical companies, at facilities of the National Institutes of Health, and in academic labs like the ones here at Harvard. These small molecule libraries are the starting points for finding new drugs through high throughput screening. The idea behind this approach is to cast a wide net. To begin with large numbers of these small molecules, ranging from 10,000 all the way up to 1 million, and then to eventually end up with one or two really good drugs. Identifying which of these thousands of small molecules would give us the best drugs begins with high throughput screening. So the definition of high throughput screening is testing large libraries of small molecules for their ability to exert a desired effect on a cell, protein, or organism. So what do I mean by a desired effect? A desired effect is any biological or chemical change with relevance to a disease. For example, a desired effect might be tumor cell death. So in the context of cancer, we want to find a small molecule drug that's really good at causing the death of the tumor cells. Another desired effect might be blocking viral replication. So in the context of a viral infection, you want to find a small molecule drug that's really good at preventing the virus from replicating and spreading uh, through your body and to other people. So how do we test a small molecule's ability to exert such a desired effect? We do so by looking for a change as a result of exposure to the small molecule. For example, we might want to look for a change in the appearance of the cell that is exposed to a small molecule drug or a change in a chemical reaction or a biological process that's going on inside of the cell that's been exposed to a small molecule drug. To give you an example of what I mean by looking for a change and measuring the desired effect, I'd like to share with you an experiment that I did in the lab. So in this experiment, I took some tumor cells and to them I added a small molecule drug. I waited a few days for the drug to, have, to interact with the cells and then at the end of the experiment I determined the cell number. The desired effect I was looking for was the drug's ability to inhibit the growth and survival of the tumor cells. And here's the result of my experiment. So what you're looking at is something called a 96-well microplate. On it, there are 96 separate compartments to which I added my tumor cells. And in order to measure cell number, I didn't actually count the number of cells in each compartment. Instead, I just simply added a reagent whose color can give me an indication of the number of cells in each compartment. The more living cells, the darker the color. Here you can see that some of these compartments are lighter compared to some of the others, indicating less tumor cells as a result of adding the drug. So here I've measured, once again, the desired effect of inhibiting the growth and survival of the tumor cells with my drug. Now it's really important to be able to get a good, consistent um, reading of this desired effect. You cannot go forward with a high throughput screen unless you have that. So once you have this consistent desired effect, you can then begin your high throughput screen. And the general flow of the high throughput screen is very similar to that little experiment that I did in the lab. You begin by adding cells to microplates, and then you add your small, mo small molecules from your collection of um, 10,000 to 1 million. You wait a few days for the drugs to have their effects, and then you measure the desired effect, for instance, tumor cell death. In the end, you come out with things that are called HITs. HITs are the small molecules that give the most robust output for the desired effect. For instance, the highest percent of tumor cell death. Nowadays, it's possible to screen up to 50,000 small molecules a day. But this would not be possible by hand or by using graduate student laborers like myself. Instead, um, high throughput screening employs robots. So what you're looking at here on the left is a screening system at the National Institutes of Health which is composed of a series of workstations arranged around a central robotic arm. And this robot transports microplates from station to station, um, adding the uh, cells and the small molecules at one station, mixing perhaps at another station, and then finally having a machine scan over for the desired effects. On the right side, you, you see a close-up image of this robotic arm, which is currently retrieving some plates from a stack of microplates. 
So such robotics can significantly facilitate the high throughput screening process. Now I said the end result of the high throughput screen is the generation of hits, the small molecules that give us the best results for the desired effect. After this point, further testing on the resulting hits is performed to confirm and refine them. And eventually you end up with three to six of the best small molecules that are selected for further drug development. And that takes us to point number two from Vinny's slide. So here, as she explained, this set of small, molecule that, small molecules that we're left with is modified to improve their effects as a drug and to also um, uh, to improve minimizing toxicity and, and increasing chemical stability. And hopefully, one of these will then go on to clinical trials and FDA approval. So to drive home the point that high throughput screening can be a successful means by which novel drugs are discovered, I just want to share with you some examples of recently approved drugs um, with origins in high throughput screening. So as you can see, they're applicable to different diseases like cancer, HIV, and pulmonary hypertension, and all have been approved within the last 10 years. Interestingly, you can also see the time that it took from the initial high throughput screen to the point of FDA approval, reflecting what Vinny talked about in terms of the time that it takes to get to the point where the drug is on the market. So at this point, I hope that you've gained an appreciation of high throughput screening. And to briefly review the section, I talked about how small molecule libraries are the starting point of high throughput screens. I told you that we test these libraries to find the small molecules that give us the best desired effect, for instance, tumor cell death. And finally, I told you how the high throughput screen results in a, series, a, a set of hits that can further be developed um, before animal and clinical testing. So with that, I'd like to open the floor to any questions. Um, why is it so hard to find a cancer drug that only targets cancer cells? Oh, why is it so hard to find a drug? I can repeat your question. The question. So the question is, why is it so hard to find a cancer drug that only targets cancer cells? So first of all, all cancer cells are not one cancer is not the same as another cancer. So breast cancer is not the same as brain cancer. Um, it's not the same as pancreatic cancer, et cetera. And the reason that it is a cancer is because something is, has gone terribly wrong that has caused these cells to proliferate really fast and um, not respond to uh, signals that um, tell it to stop. And these things that are going wrong in the different cancers are actually different. And so you can't just have one small molecule that's applicable to all types of cancers. Um, and another really big point is that there is often the effect of resistance that comes up, comes up, which is something I'm studying in the lab. So you might have a drug that actually works really well in a particular cancer, but then the cancer mutates and gets around it. And so you, know, you, know, you have the problem of uh, not being able to treat that cancer once again. Hi. Do you, could you talk a little bit about how you select your small molecules? I mean, is, is there heuristics involved because there's so many of them to pick them, or is it just random that you're... So how you select your small molecules to begin your high throughput screen? Is, is that the question? Okay, so the, once again, the question is, how do you select your small molecules for your high throughput screen? So if, when, when high throughput screen first started, there wasn't any sort of selection for that. They just sort of collected things from nature, you know, they went out into the rainforest or um, in the oceans and they collected things and then they synthesized things chemically and then they just threw them on the screen. Nowadays they do it with more information. They actually begin with small molecules that will likely have more, um, will likely be better drugs later on. So they're kind of thinking ahead and thinking this sort of small molecule has a structure that gives it more drug-like properties like it will probably be stable chemically, or it will be easy to modify later on. Um, they also get rid of any small molecules that tend to have too many effects, So, because we want to have a drug that's very specific. So in fact, they do um, look for certain properties nowadays when they're looking at what to start with. Um, I can you hear me clearly? Um, my question, you alluded to it a little bit when you answered the last question. I seem to be getting echo. I don't know how to, is this better? Um, my question anyways is, where do these libraries come from or, or how are they assembled or 
that makes my question clear. So where are the small molecules coming from? So as Vinny pointed out, we can find small molecules from nature. So we can actually, plants produce chemicals, and we can extract these chemicals from plants, and we can use them in the small molecule screens, or we can modify them chemically and add them to the chemical library. Also, we can just chemically synthesize small molecules. So we just talked about high throughput screening and how this is a method to find um, small molecule drugs. Another mode of small molecule-based drug discovery is rational drug design. So what is rational drug design? In contrast to traditional methods of drug discovery, which relied a lot on trial and error testing of small molecules for a desired effect, rational drug design begins with the prediction that modulation of a specific protein target will have a therapeutic effect. And so the goal of rational drug design is to be able to identify small molecules that will bind to your protein target to give that therapeutic effect. One way of doing this um, is to actually screen for small molecules that will bind to your protein target, just kind of like what I talked about in high throughput screening. Another way of doing this is by starting out knowing what the structure of your protein target looks like and then being able to predict what sort of small molecule will bind to that um, protein target. But how do we know the structure of our protein? So there are several methods of identifying protein structure. One um, popular method is called X-ray crystallography, which is essentially taking an X-ray of your uh, protein. So in this method, we produce an ordered arrangement of the protein in the form of a crystal, and then we just hit it with X-ray beams. And these beams bounce off of the protein crystal, and they, uh, they, cause, they make a deflection um, pattern, which can be analyzed computationally to give you the model of the protein. Now, not all proteins can be uh, crystallized. And in fact, there are newer methods of trying to predict protein structure. And these newer methods rely on knowing what the protein is made of. So as some of you might know, proteins are made out of smaller building blocks called amino acid. And the DNA, as per the central dogma, instructs the linear order of, of these amino acids. But proteins themselves are not linear structures. Rather, they're three-dimensional forms in space. And so it is the unique properties of each individual amino acid. Here I depicted a different amino acid with a different color that predicts the, um, that determines how this linear structure folds up into a three-dimensional form. And in rational drug design, we can know the structure of the protein and its amino acids, and we can actually model it with computers. So here is um, a protein found in our blood. Um, it's supposed to animate, so let's see if it does. Okay, well. Um, and uh, basically what you can appreciate from this, so from such three-dimensional structures is, wait, I just think it looks really cool. OK. Um, what you can appreciate from just looking at the protein three-dimensional structure is that you can actually predict where in the grooves and crevices of this three-dimensional form you can fit a small molecule. So a great example of using protein structure to inform drug design was the discovery of HIV-1 protease inhibitors. These small molecule drugs block the action of a key viral protein in HIV-1, the virus that causes AIDS. Um, to the right is the schematic figure of the virus and the proteins it's made of, and the protein that the drug is blocking is the protease. By blocking this protein, the drug prevents the formation of functional virus. To see how, let's look at the viral biology. So HIV also relies on amino acids as building blocks for its proteins. And during viral replication, the virus makes a long chain of amino acids that includes several proteins. As a chain, however, these proteins are not functional, and thus, in this state, the virus cannot replicate. This is where the viral protease becomes important. I like to think of the viral protease as Pac-Man, because it likes to chew things up. And what it does is it comes in and it chews up non-functional viral proteins. Um, and in this case, it chews up this chain at the indicated red lines. By chewing up the chain, it breaks it, this long chain into separate proteins that are now functional. And this process is necessary for viral replication. So if we want to make a drug that prevents the virus from replicating, we can actually make a small molecule 
that comes in and blocks the activity of the protease. Here is a visual representation of what I mean. We want to design a small molecule drug that binds to and inhibits the viral protease. And in rational drug design, we are able to do this because we know the structure of the protease. And in this case, we know what can fit into the mouth of the Pac-Man. This will prevent the protease from chewing up the non-functional virus and thus prevent the virus from replicating. Okay. And this, okay, so some slides were skipped, unfortunately, but um, this is actually a very good successful story of rational drug design, and these HIV-1 protease inhibitors um, were, um, have been used in antiretroviral therapies since the 1990s. So actually a number of slides have been skipped um, in the presentation. So um, we're going to have to close it. Yeah. Sorry about that. Um, let me see if I can find. OK, I think it's just repeating here. Yeah, um, how about we take some questions? So, anybody have questions on rational drug design? So, okay. I'm the, yeah, I know where, so we're, so we're just going to do two things at once. In the first uh, example of high throughput screening, it seemed like a very, at least the way you, you described it so nicely to us, and thank you for a good presentation, is it seemed that uh, it was a very mechanical type process. And um, so I wasn't quite clear why something of that nature would be done at a, in an academic setting, where I would think creativity was really the thing that the academic setting would bring to bear. In the second case, it's perhaps clearer why. Okay, so the question is, why would, in the academic setting, would we do a high throughput screen? So um, that's a great question. So in we do do high throughput screens, and we do perhaps not that, that high throughput where we do a one million um, small molecules, but um, high throughput screens are just the beginning point of opening up a whole um, pathway to new understanding biology. So, for instance, if we don't necessarily understand um, how some sort of the disease works or how something works, we can do a screen to identify the important proteins that might be um, relevant for that disease. And in academia, we're really interested in understanding the basics of biology. And so this would be a case where we'd want to do a screen to start some, a project. A quick question. Uh, when you're doing the high uh, throughput screening, uh, if uh, one of the drug is basically uh, giving a consistent pattern for only a lesser amount of percentage, for example, 30 percentage, would, would you guys be like still pursuing that or like you know you it should have to have a, a higher threshold for you to pursue it I mean even though it is consistent giving some results so if, the question is is if a target if a small molecule 30 percent of the time works would we still pursue it I would say no typically they have a pretty stringent cutoff and in fact in a high throughput screen usually the success rate in terms of how many hits you get is between 0.1 to 5%. So depending on how large you start with, you end up, you really want to hone in and, and come down to eventually one or two really good drugs. So you don't... So what you're saying is like, you know, uh, these drugs, uh, the screening is, doesn't actually uh, consider a combination. It just only talk about just single, uh, you know, element. If, so basically, if one is like, you know, 50% you know, successful, the other one is 50% successful, mm -hmm. if they can be you know, used in combination, Together. you are you know, increasing the odds. I mean. That is a possibility. Um, I, I think that it's possible that they do pursue those two in combination and, and maybe follow up with some um, further testing. I think that depending on the size of the original screen, so if there were a million compounds and they happen to find that a lot, that, to, you know, that sort of pattern come up a lot, then... Um, 
maybe they wouldn't pursue them in combination right away. Maybe that would be something that they would save for the future. Okay, we're back. Sorry about that. Um, we'll save it. I'm almost at the end of this section. Um, so, okay, so actually let's just end this section. Um, so to review rational drug design, we began with um, knowledge of a protein target. So rather than just screening um, for some very general or desired effect, here we actually began by knowing the, the protein that we're trying to modulate. And then we look for small molecules that can bind to the protein target and modulate its function, for instance, inhibit its function. Um, and some, one way of doing this is by t using the protein structure to inform us of how to design a small molecule to fit into that structure. For instance, in the case of the protease um, inhibitors, we knew the structure of the protease and we were able to design a small molecule that could inhibit its function. So with that, um, any more questions on rational drug design? One more and then you'll go for it. So uh, you described the HIV drug as an inhibitor and the Lipitor drug was an inhibitor. So is it by definition a small molecule drug an inhibitor? No, it is not by definition. So the question is, is a small molecule drug by definition an inhibitor? It is not by definition an inhibitor. And in fact, there, it is possible to have a small molecule that actually activates um, something. Typically, and I think more historically and more commonly, they are inhibitors, however. So up to now, I've only talked about small molecule-based drugs and how they can be discovered. Now I'm going to switch gears a little bit and tell you about protein-based drugs, uh, which are made by recombinant DNA technology. So in this case, rather than relying on small molecules to modulate the protein function, we're actually making the protein to treat the disease. Uh, to explain how this is done through recombinant DNA technology and to give you examples of a protein that we can make to treat disease, let's consider insulin and type 1 diabetes. This is something that uh, Vinny already touched upon. But just to review general insulin signaling, in a healthy adult, uh, insulin signaling regulates blood sugar, and it allows us to store energy from our food. So when we ingest food, insulin gets released from cells in our pancreas, and this causes our tissues to uptake glucose, the sugar derived from our food. This action of insulin lowers our blood sugar. Now, in type 1 diabetes, the insulin-producing cells in the pancreas are destroyed, and uh, this results in insulin deficiency and inability to regulate blood sugar, which is harmful to our tissues. So these patients need to be treated by giving them external sources of insulin. Historically, as Vinny mentioned, these sources came from animals. So we would collect pancreases from cows, horses, and pigs, and we would take the insulin from them and give them to patients. Today, all insulin distributed in the United States is human insulin made with the help of biotechnology. So how can we make human insulin for patients? This goes back to the central dogma that Vinny described where we know that DNA instructs the formation of proteins. In this case, the protein of interest is insulin. So what we can do is we can take the gene or the segment of DNA that has information for making human insulin, and we can insert it into a cell, which is outside of the body. We can then, uh, inside of the cell, um, the human insulin gets made from the DNA instructions. So now we have the protein being made inside of the cell. Now imagine this happening in lots and lots of cells, um, making lots and lots of this protein. The cells are like a factory for making protein-based drugs, and we can collect them and purify them and give them to patients. This process of inserting human genes into cells to rapidly produce large amounts of protein is called recombinant DNA technology, and it is what allows us to make protein-based drugs. However, this process is, um, is very difficult and costly. Um, and it re for instance, it requires very strict cell growing conditions. These cells require the right pH, the right nutrients, the right temperature. Um, and to give you an idea of like, how this process looks like, this picture at the right is of what is called a bioreactor. And it stores 1,000 liters of these cells, which are being grown to produce uh, protein-based drugs. Another issue with biologics is, viral, is contamination. So some of you might have heard of, uh, in 2009, 
that uh, Genzyme had experienced viral contamination at one of their plants here in Austin, Massachusetts. And um, this caused the facility to have to shut down their entire operations for several days and cost the company millions of dollars. And in fact, um, this also adds to the cost of biologics, these sorts of issues that can come up. And I believe that biologics and the cost of biologics is going to be something that's going to be very relevant in the news right now and also in the near future. So I, I watch out for that because biologics are really becoming a sizable market in therapeutics. And so that takes us to the end of my part of tonight's seminar. Um, and to quickly summarize what I talked about, I gave you three different approaches to current drug discovery. The first was high throughput screening in which we identify small molecule based drugs from large chemical libraries. The second was rational drug design in which we start with a known protein target and we design a small molecule drug that can bind to that protein target and modulate its effects. And finally, I told you about biologics, which is the process of synthesizing proteins to help treat disease. And with that, I'd like to op thank you for listening and open the floor to any more questions. A uh, very quick question and also very practical. Um, can you briefly comment uh, between the advantage and disadvantage of small molecule versus biologics as therapeutics? Okay, the question is, can I comment on the advantages and disadvantages of small molecules versus biologics? So great question because there are some significant differences. Um, one thing that I just talked about is cost. Right now, small molecules on average cost $1 per day. Um, the generic versions of them, cents per day. Biologic, $22 per day. So that gives you one of the advantages of small molecules over biologics. Um, another is that biologics, you can actually replace the non-functional protein. So it can cover a whole class of diseases that cannot be targeted by small molecules because small molecules can only modulate the function of an existing protein. Um, and I think and, oh, another um, example is small molecules just by size are so much smaller than biologics. Um, and so small molecules can be simply taken by mouth and ingested, whereas biologics need to be injected into um, the patient. They're much, much larger. Are the chemical libraries all agreed upon and standardized? So if you're a researcher at another facility like MD Anderson, and you're researching something. Uh, you're not recreating what Harvard's doing. It's all agreed upon and standardized. Yeah. So and you have a searchable database, if you will. Yeah. Um, so good question. So the question is, are the chemical libraries, the small molecule libraries, are they standardized? And in fact, there are efforts right now by the National Institute of Health that have these sort of collections that can be used by um, research facilities. And so, uh, yeah, I think the efforts are so that aiming towards not having to repeat making the same small molecules. But be historically, each company actually had their own sort of set of small molecule libraries. And these small molecule libraries were very precious to them, and they didn't want to share them um, because eventually they would lead to, you know, a, a discovery of a drug. So, but there are publicly available. Stuff. How is collaboration going these days, if you will? Oh, uh, um... <laughs> I don't know if I'm the expert to comment on collaboration between FDA and pharmaceuticals, but I think that, especially with the current economic climate, I think that there's probably increased collaboration between um, academia, pharmaceuticals, um, and the National Institute of Health and the government. And I think that looking to the future, um, collaboration actually benefits everyone. So, yeah. Great. Thanks, Kat. So we'll go to a five minute break now. Um, if you don't have one already, please pick up a survey to turn in after the third speaker. And if you're sitting up in the back, uh, do motion to us if you want to ask a question. I'll be sitting in the back for the third speaker. Thank you. Oh, and if you want to sign up for the lab tour, make sure to do that now because it's limited to 20 spaces. Yeah, I think 
Hi everyone, we're going to get back to the talk now with Dima, our third speaker. And you should know that the lab tour is in Dima's lab. So if you have any questions afterwards, I think we have a few more slots left. We don't have to run the lists over tonight, but we do have to limit to 20 people. Um, everyone should have a survey, as Amy mentioned. Please hold on to this to the end of the lecture, but then hand it in afterwards. If you've been to our events before this season, you don't have to fill out the bottom section. We only need that once. But the top part is how we get feedback to the speakers and also to our organization on how we can improve. So don't forget to hand these in. And also, just to remind you, our lecture next week, same time, same place, is called Living Foods, the Microbiology of Food and Drink. And the three speakers are all from Harvard's Department of Organismic and Evolutionary Biology. And they're going to talk about all different uh, fermented foods that depend on microbes. So we hope to see you again next week. And now I'll turn it over to Dima. What about now? Yep, yeah, great. Uh, so hi, my name is Dima. I'm a second year graduate student in the Molecular and Cellular Biology program here at Harvard. Uh, I work in George Church's lab, so if any of you want to see where I work, you can come to the tour. And I work on uh, various aspects of RNA biology and RNAi, which I'll be talking about. And so the, the previous two parts of, the, of today's talk were about what is a drug, um, how do we develop it, and what are the currently used drugs that if you go to a doctor and get a drug, what is it going to be made of? And so most drugs today are small molecules, but there's an increasing number of uh, biologics or mostly protein drugs as Kat described. And I'll be talking about uh, two new uh, classes of drugs. These are not yet approved. They're not yet on the market, but they're both in clinical trials, and you might have heard of them. One is gene therapy, which is a DNA-based drug. And the other is RNA interference, or RNAi for short, and that's an RNA-based drug. And these are two broad classes of drugs that within five years could be approved and could be on the market treating diseases that are uh, not, cannot be treated with small molecules and proteins. So I'll give you an example of each. And I'll start with gene therapy, which as I said is a DNA-based drug. And so in order for me to explain how uh, gene therapy works, I'd just like to make sure everyone remembers, it was previously described in the first lecture, the central dogma of molecular biology. And so 
as was described, DNA stores all the instructions for making the different proteins. Uh, RNA is the messenger that decides which, which protein is made. So RNA copies DNA and goes to the part of the cell that makes the protein and has the instructions for doing so. And the proteins are the machines that carry out the functions of the cell. And so many diseases are caused by mutations. A mutation is a change in DNA, in a small part of DNA. Um, and this change is copied into the RNA because an RNA is a perfect copy of the DNA. And then this copy can, in many cases, change the order of the amino acids, which Kat talked about. And this changes the structure of the protein. So the protein, because of this little change, because of this mutation, can fold differently. And in many cases, when it folds differently, it's no longer active. And so the disease I'll be talking to you about is adrenoleukodystrophy, or ALD. It was uh, featured in the movie Lorenzo's Oil, which some of you may have seen. And it's caused by a mutation in a gene called ABCD1. So we know what gene causes it. This mutation, again, is carried over into the RNA and causes the protein to be a bit different than in people who don't have this disease. The, the protein is folded differently, and it's no longer functional. The normal protein, uh, ABCD1, it um, is part of a group of proteins that takes long fat molecules called very long chain fatty acids, and it converts them into small fat molecules that are used as different structural components of the cell. They're used to build different things in the cell. However, in patients with ALD, you have this ABCD1 protein that's inactive because of the mutation. And so these long fat molecules, they cannot be converted into the short fat molecules. And what happens is they start to accumulate in different tissues, and particularly in the brain. And so this accumulation of long fat molecules is actually very toxic to the brain. And the reason that it's toxic is because it affects myelin. So myelin is this, um, it's shown here in orange, it, it's a protective covering of neurons. A neuron is a brain cell, which is depicted here. And so the myelin covers the body of the, of the brain cell, and it's required for the brain cell to function. So a brain cell functions by uh, electrical signals. So it sends electrical signals to other cells. And the myelin is sort of an insulator, kind of like in an electric wire. And if you don't have myelin, the brain cell won't be able to signal. And so it turns out that in ALD patients, um, their myelin gets degraded. So when you have these long uh, fat molecules that clump up in the brain, you get demyelination or the degradation of myelin. So your, your brain cells don't have myelin anymore. And so they cannot function. They can't send signals and they can't communicate with other brain cells and other parts of the body. And so here is an MRI brain scan of a patient with ALD. Uh, usually patients are diagnosed with initial symptoms around eight to 10 years old. And so, as you can see, um, at the top you have, at diagnosis, there's a little bit of, of white. The brain is gray, but there's a little bit of white. And white corresponds to parts of the brain where the brain cells don't have myelin. And so in the beginning, there's a little bit of white. But as you can see, between one and two years, most of the brain is white. And that means that most of these brain cells are losing their myelin and can no longer function. And actually, after one to two years, patients can no longer um, control their bodies. They're in a vegetative state and they die shortly thereafter. And there's almost uh, no way to treat this disease. It's a very small fraction of patients that can get a bone marrow transplant, which was briefly covered, but this, um, this is actually a very dangerous um, procedure that kills a lot of patients by itself. And most, for most patients, it's not an option. And so how can we fix this disease? As I said, we know the gene that causes it. And can we use this information to try to come up with a therapy? So does anyone have any ideas about how we could potentially affect this disease? What kind of general things we would want to do at the molecular level if we're a scientist trying to design a drug? This is like um, so in this case, you, you don't have any, any of the normal protein, right? Yes? So insert something in the cell that's going to uh, catch the aberrant RNA and modify it and thus uh, allow it to create an appropriate protein. Right, so if you could modify this RNA and make it delete the mutation, that would be great. Uh, unfortunately, we actually don't know how to do that at a molecular level, but theoretically that is possible. Are there any other ideas of what you could potentially do? Simply insert the correct RNA sequence in addition to the bad one, and hopefully that will make it 
the number for rotating what you want them to work. Right, so it's very close to what I'm going to talk about that um, is currently being done. Uh, the, suge the suggestion was what if we put in the correct RNA uh, into the patients and then that will produce the correct protein and that's very close to what's being done. The problem with that is that RNA is very difficult to deliver and it degrades very quickly into in the blood and I'll be talking about that in the second part of the talk but theoretically that would work. I just want to point out that this disease can't really be treated with small molecules because you're not trying to inhibit a protein or activate a protein. You have a mutated protein that doesn't work at all. And it can't be treated with a protein, with a biologic either. So theoretically, you might think, well, maybe I can make, using a recombinant DNA technology, make the correct ABCD1 protein, just inject that into the bloodstream of, of patients. That doesn't work in this case because um, this protein, in order to function, needs to be in a very specific place in the cell. And if you just inject a protein to the blood, it actually is too big to generally go into most cells. And it won't go into that specific location where it's needed. So you can't, you can't use a small molecule and you can't use a protein. Um, RNA could theoretically work, but the way we deliver it now, it's very unstable. And you would have to deliver it a lot. Um, so actually, what we could do is something called gene therapy. So the idea behind gene therapy is what if we put in the DNA into the patient cells? What if we put in the DNA for the correct ABCD1 protein? And then have the patient's own cells use that DNA to make RNA for the correct protein without the mutation. And then from that RNA, the correct protein will be made. So that's the idea behind gene therapy. And it's applicable to many diseases, including ALD. So one question is, where do we put this DNA? Um, we can't modify a whole human at this point although some people want to. Um, so we have to, we have to think about what kind of cell we can manipulate and add this DNA to. And so what's uh, thought to be the best solution is blood stem cells. Some of you may have heard of stem cells. These are cells that can give rise to other kinds of cells. And blood stem cells are a particular kind of stem cell that can give rise to other cells that make up the blood, such as red blood cells, immune cells, and certain cells like microglia that actually go to the brain. So the idea, if we want to use gene therapy, is to isolate these blood stem cells from patients. This can be done from the blood, uh, from the bone marrow. And then we take them out of the body into the laboratory, and we somehow insert DNA into these cells that codes for the correct, that has the instructions for the correct ABCD1 protein. Then we can inject these blood stem cells back into the patient with the correct version of the DNA, which makes the correct protein. You still have your mutated version of DNA, and it's making your misfolded protein, but it's not doing anything. So I didn't uh, show it in this diagram. But you are making the correct protein. And then since when cells divide, all the DNA is copied, all of the uh, cells that come from the blood stem cells will have this new DNA that we inserted, and they will all, uh, kind of like factories, make their own protein, the correct ABCD1 protein. So this is theoretically what we could do with gene therapy. One of the major challenges is that it's actually also very hard to get DNA into cells. DNA compared to a small molecule is very, very large. And so it's actually been extremely difficult to get DNA into cells. And so what scientists have done is look to nature to see can DNA get into cells anywhere in nature. And it turns out that a virus can do this. So a virus is a, a protein particle depicted here in purple, and it contains DNA or RNA. Here I've shown a DNA virus. So it's a protein with DNA inside. And usually this DNA has the information for making viral proteins. So when the virus uh, infects a cell, it injects its DNA into the cell. Um, the viral DNA codes for viral proteins, so more viral proteins are made, and then that's how the virus replicates. So this is a way that um, a virus can inject DNA. So scientists thought, what if we could hijack this mechanism and use it to deliver the DNA we want, which is the correct ABCD1 gene? And so it turns out that we can do this. There's people that figure out how to take DNA out of an existing virus, put in DNA we want, in this case ABCD1, and then use the virus, uh, the virus's mechanism of getting DNA into cells to get our ABCD1 DNA into cells. And so this is a, a virus that's heavily modified. It, it doesn't replicate anymore. And so although it has some similarities to viruses that 
cause disease that are infectious, this virus can't replicate, and we've now changed it such that it doesn't have uh, adverse effects, it doesn't infect us in the, in the traditional way. It doesn't replicate, infect more and more cells. And so this is what we can do. As I said before, we can isolate the blood stem cells from the patient. We can add the virus that will give us uh, a version of the DNA that doesn't have the mutation. Then we can inject these modified blood stem cells with the gene therapy back into the patient. And then these cells will divide into other kinds of cells and some of these cells will uh, go to the brain, for example, and then since they have, since they're all making the correct protein, because they have the correct DNA without the mutation, some of them can actually affect this disease, ALD. And the reason they can do that is they can actually start to chop up these long fats that are toxic into short ones. So the cells that have gene therapy, you have the correct version of ABD, ABCD1, which is functional, and it can chop up the long fats into short ones. And so if you do this, um, you stop the demyelination, you stop the degradation of myelin that um, causes uh, the loss of brain function in these patients and ultimately their death. And so what I showed you is how you could do this. This is kind of a scheme, it's a bit complicated. You're using viruses, you're modifying them, you're using cells that you're taking out of the body, um, you're putting new DNA in, you're putting the cells back into the body and you're letting the cell produce the protein. So there's a lot of potential problems. But it turns out that this is actually something that uh, scientists have been able to do. So actually, it turns out that at a Boston-based uh, company called Bluebird Bio, they did exactly what I described and they treated two uh, patients. So this is an early clinical trial and two patients have gone this treatment. And here are the results. So on the very right, you see the uh, patient with no gene therapy, which I showed before, and you see, again, uh, all this white in the brain after 24 months, and that corresponds to brain cells that lose all their myelin and can't function. However, the two patients on the left, um, these are patients that got this gene therapy. And as you can see, they still have a little bit of white, but after 24 or even 30 months, uh, most of their brain does not have white. So the brain cells still have their myelin. And it turns out that these kids, um, although previously they had no other options and would have died, they're still alive and well today because of this gene therapy. And um, they're pretty much fine. They don't have any symptoms. Whereas if they wouldn't have gone this, they would have uh, all gone to a vegetative state and died shortly thereafter. And so if anyone has any questions on gene therapy, I can take them now. Uh, thank you. I thought I heard once in the news that uh, this gene therapy, I believe in Philadelphia, it caused uh, a death or something like that. Can you comment on that? Sure. Uh, yes. So the very first gene therapy in the U.S., uh, the trial was stopped because of an adverse effect that actually caused death. Um, and so there are some technical things that scientists have figured out since then in making the virus more safe. The problem was with the virus. Um, but scientists have since uh, figured out how to make the virus more safe, that, and that really minimizes uh, these side effects like death. That was in 1999. If the, my question concerns how, what the mechanism is for the degradation of those long chain fatty acids, because it looks like they must be sort of in the um, environment and affecting the myelin because you're not actually injecting the, the right um, enzyme into the, um, the myelin itself? It's a great question. Uh, so the question is, um, how do the, uh, long fat, uh, the long fats, the very long chain fatty acids, how do they get degraded and why do they cause the degradation of myelin? Um, so actually it's not fully understood why uh, this accumulation of fat molecules causes uh, the degradation of myelin. One of the ideas is that it actually causes uh, cell death of the cells that make up the myelin, but it's actually not fully understood. So that's a question. So we know that this uh, mutation causes the uh, disease, but we don't know all the steps of the mechanism. Does the myelin actually grow back? Uh, right. So, so myelin is, regen is regenerated at some rate. Um, and so in this case, it's not uh, fully understood whether the myelin grows back or whether the degradation of the myelin is stopped 
it's a bit hard to tease apart. But at is, the end, is there a similar process in Alzheimer's? Is that a myelin thing too? So the question is whether uh, Alzheimer's is similar. So actually, Alzheimer occurs uh, through a different mechanism, but actually, multiple sclerosis occurs through the degradation of myelin. That's what I meant. I meant multiple. Oh, multiple sclerosis. That's right. Yes. So it's very similar. Multiple sclerosis has a completely different cause. It's an autoimmune disease, but uh, it's a similar uh, progression. Yes. So, I the one from my high school biology class when you went through mitosis to do, do cell replication, it was replicating the chromosomes. Mm -hmm. How does this mechanism work? Are you is the virus inserting the gene into the chromosome, or is it somehow being replicated along with the chromosome during mitosis? So the, the question is, um, how does the DNA get, whether the DNA of the gene therapy from the virus gets integrated into the chromosome, where the normal DNA is, or whether it's outside. So in the case of this particular virus, the DNA does get integrated into the chromosome. Um, but there are actually viruses that don't do that. So either way, it can happen. Um, in this case, it is integrated into the chromosome, and the whole chromosome gets replicated. All right. And so that was uh, gene therapy, which is a DNA-based therapy. And I'll talk about one more type of therapy called RNA interference, or RNAi. This is actually something that I'm working on in the lab. Um, and this is an RNA-based therapy. And so again, in order to fully understand how this works, uh, I just want to remind you of the central dogma. The information is stored in DNA. It's copied into RNA. And that RNA takes these, those instructions to the part of the cell where the protein is made. And um, that's how the protein is made from the information in the RNA. The disease I'm going to tell you about now is one called transthyretin or TTR amyloidosis. And this is also a lethal disease uh, for which there's almost no drugs. And the gene that causes this is also known. It's actually the TTR gene. So there's a gene called TTR and it makes a certain protein. And in these patients, you have a mutation in the TTR gene. And so, again, that mutation is carried over into the RNA, and it makes a misfolded protein. However, in this case, uh, the protein is misfolded, and it doesn't just not do its normal function. It actually, the protein itself forms toxic aggregates. And this actually causes the problem, because these toxic protein aggregates, they accumulate in various tissues, like the heart, and they cause heart disease. So that's usually what the patients uh, die of. And so in this case, it's not that the protein doesn't do what it usually does. That's the problem. It's the, the problem is that the protein is changed into something bad that causes this disease. And so now uh, this is a different type of disease. And can we think about using the mechanism that we know? Can anyone think of a general way of stopping this disease? It's very close, very close to what I'll talk about. Um, and that is one solution. Can I? Oh, sorry. So she said if we can somehow uh, in, stop the RNA by making another RNA that somehow destroys it. And uh, I haven't explained uh, the mechanism of RNAi, but that's very close to what actually uh, can happen. Are there any other ideas? So in this case, it's the problem is not with alternative splicing, but there are diseases where you do want to do that. So that's a problem that's specific to the RNA, not in this particular one. Right. So theoretically, you could have a small molecule that just prevents this aggregation, and that would work. In, in theory, though, this doesn't work. And part of the reason is that small molecules are really tiny compared to these proteins. And so no one's found a small molecule that can actually physically prevent this clumping. So in theory, it could work, but in practice, it does not, and people have tried. Any last ideas? Could you insert something that would essentially chop that protein up? Right. So another idea is, what if we could specifically chop this protein up? And there's no way that we could target a specific protein to be chopped up, but that would work, theoretically. Okay. So again, I mentioned that a small molecule can't be used. 
And um, you can't really use a protein, a biologic drug either, because um, the problem isn't that you want to replace uh, the mutated protein. The problem is the mutated protein itself. It causes a toxic effect. And gene therapy in this case can't be used for the same reason because you're not trying to make a new protein. You want to destroy this existing bad protein that's being produced. And so the technique that we can use is called RNA interference, or RNAi for short. Uh, this is a mechanism in a cell that allows you to target a specific RNA. This can't be done with proteins, given our knowledge of biology, but it can be done with RNA. This is actually a very recent discovery. It was only made about 15 years ago, and it got the Nobel Prize in 2006. Some of you may have uh, seen that in the news. And so this is a technique that we could potentially use therapeutically. So if we could inhibit this RNA, this bad RNA specifically, the mutated TTR RNA, the protein wouldn't be produced. And then you wouldn't have this aggregation, this toxic clumping. And the way it works is uh, it has two components. There's the RNA machinery, which is present in the cell, in all cells, in all, my, in all of our cells. And I've depicted that with scissors. And then there's the part you put in, which is the short interfering RNA. That's essentially your drug. And part of the short interfering RNA, called the guide, hooks up to the RNAi machinery, to these scissors, and it tells the RNAi machinery where to go, which RNA to target. And so it takes these scissors to a specific RNA, and then it chops up that RNA. And so if you chop up that RNA, you can't make the protein because the RNA contains the instructions you need for making the protein. So you don't have the protein. And so you can imagine that we could apply this to TTR amyloidosis. If we can design um, uh, an siRNA that targets the TTR RNA, it'll take the RNAi machinery there. The RNAi machinery will specifically degrade that RNA and not other RNAs. It would be problematic, of course, if you degrade all RNAs. This will prevent the formation of the toxic protein, and then you won't have this clumping. Um, so this, this sounds great in practice. There's been one huge challenge uh, that people have been working on, and that's how to deliver these RNAs. As I mentioned previously, um, RNA is very unstable in the blood. Um, it gets degraded very, very quickly within a few seconds. And also, RNA is very large and cannot get into a cell because the cell is surrounded by the cell membrane that keeps, keeps things out. And so uh, what scientists have, have done in, in the clinical trials that I'm describing here with RNAi is they've thought of putting the siRNA, the drug, into a protective ball. And so first of all, what this does, this protective ball protects the RNA from being degraded because proteins can't chew it up because it's physically enclosed in a ball. And this protective ball is also made of the same material as the outside of a cell, of a, the same material as the cell membrane. And so it turns out that this ball can fuse with the cell membrane, connects with the cell membrane, and can drop the uh, siRNA drug into the cells. So that's how, in this particular example of TTR amyloidosis, uh, scientists at a company called Alnylam, also here in Boston, uh, have figured out how to deliver RNAi. And that's currently in phase two clinical trials and may be approved in the next few years. And so just to summarize um, what I've told you, um, I built on the previous two talks, which told you about existing drugs. And existing drugs uh, target uh, the cell at the level of proteins. We can either inhibit a protein with a small molecule, which is what happens with most small molecules. In some cases, a small molecule can activate a protein. Or uh, we can make a protein outside of a cell using recombinant DNA technology and just inject that protein into the bloodstream if uh, we're trying to replace a protein that acts in the bloodstream, because these proteins usually don't get into cells. But I described two entirely new classes of drugs called gene therapy and RNA interference that are not yet in the clinic, but if these clinical trials are successful, may be in the clinic within the next five years. And the two specific diseases are some of the most promising cases that I think have the highest likelihood of success and can't be treated with any other drugs, such as small molecules or proteins. And with that, I'll be glad to take any questions. And again, I'd like to thank our sponsors. Thank you. Thank you. The question is, which therapy? 
Right. right. So the question is whether the therapy for ALD helps multiple sclerosis patients because in both diseases you lose myelin. And actually the answer is no because in multiple sclerosis, although you lose myelin, it's through a different mechanism. So it's an autoimmune disease where your immune cells attack the myelin. And because it's a different mechanism, that disease is not applicable. Although potentially you could imagine a gene therapy with a different gene for multiple sclerosis. You, thank you for a very interesting talk. Um, I was uh, wondering, you described the protective ball for the uh, interfering RNA fragment, um, but it was said in a previous talk about the, or you said, that the virus can also insert DNA or RNA. And uh, I was wondering if those, if, if um, uh, the virus approach would work with the RNA interference and whether the ball approach would work with DNA. That's a great question. So the question is whether um, we could use a virus, because I've told you that a virus can insert RNA or DNA into a cell, whether the virus can deliver RNA interference or these siRNAs. And the answer is yes, it can. Um, because viruses um, have these safety concerns, people in biotech companies have used that as a last approach, um, last resort. And so people are trying these balls first because they're safer. But there have been, in, ac in uh, academic studies, people have used the virus successfully. Uh, you also asked about whether DNA can be used in the ball. Um, and DNA is actually very large compared to an siRNA. So one of the problems has been that uh, with the balls we can make that work well, um, the DNA just won't fit. But that actually has also been tried. In a, and in a few cases in animals has worked. So theoretically, yes. So when you described the uh, RNAi, you said it's going to be it's in phase two trials right now. But I'm a little confused because it sounds like you're describing a mechanism and once that therapy is sort of approved, then do you just release a bunch of different products out there that have different, uh, uh, I forget what the location, the thing that tells it where to go. So the question is uh, whether the clinical trial that I described, which is in phase two and not yet approved, whether if when that is approved, you'll be able to launch all kinds of different RNAi drugs for different targets. And so that's a great question. Uh, so obviously it's hardest to get the first one through because this is such a new uh, class of therapies. And once the first one goes through, it will be a lot easier uh, to make other ones. And one of the great things about RNAi is that it's so modular, so easy to target a gene just based on the sequence. You don't have to do screening, for example. Uh, so if the first one is approved and it really works, which there's some evidence of in clinical trials, then yes, this could be a whole new broad class of drugs that will be approved for all kinds of different diseases. Each one still has to be tested in a clinical trial, but um, these drugs are, are chemically very similar and they have the same mechanism in terms of how they target. So yes, it'll be a lot quicker once the first one gets through. So I have actually a two part question here. The first is uh, building on what the gentleman down there talked about. If the virus can generate, it can insert DNA that gets integrated, couldn't you make DNA that produces the siRNA and thereby avoid the necessity of delivering a drug constantly because now it would be part of the cells. It'd be a gene therapy that produces the interference RNA. Okay. And secondly, the second part of it is, um, are drug companies more interested in the ball mechanism because it's a drug that they can charge for compared to a cure, which would be what the gene therapy presumably would produce? Right. Great question. So the, the first part is whether we can use the virus to make DNA that will then make uh, the siRNA. The answer is yes, that can be done, and that's been done in academic labs. Um, you could make a virus that makes DNA, and the DNA will make the, R the inhibitory siRNA. Um, as I said, the, the problem is that viruses have this notion of being unsafe because of this one clinical trial in 1999. And so pharmaceutical companies have really shied away from the use of viruses, and that's why they prefer the ball approach. Um, as you mentioned in your second question, the advantage of a virus is that potentially it can produce, the cells will produce this RNA, and so this can be a factory for the drug where you get one treatment and um, you don't need to keep giving this ball of RNA. And uh, if gene therapy was to work for this, that would be the case. Um, I would imagine that if gene therapy was approved, it would cost a lot more for that reason. Um, so drug companies would charge a lot more. Uh, but certainly cost is something that 
is being uh, is one of the factors. But another factor really is that most drug companies are very afraid of using viruses, even for diseases where there's no other possibility, just because of that one negative uh, example and the kind of the effect of the press covering it and making it seem like this crazy idea. Where whereas for many patients, it's really the only solution. Factory companies will use virus as the therapeutics. So there's no currently approved uh, viral therapeutic yes, we do have. Uh, for gene therapy. Not for, for which? Like right. So you're talking about a cancer, a cancer. Right. So the, the, the comment is about that the fact that viruses are already used in, in medicine. So in, in many cases, in vaccines, you use viruses that are changed. Uh, they're not active anymore, but they're still viruses. And that's true. And actually, there are also, there's recently been approval of a, uh, a virus that infects cancer cells. So, so it's not uh, unprecedented to use a virus, but there's no approved virus that delivers gene therapy. Uh, one question. If this concept of this ball approach mm -hmm. is so nice, how come it is taking so long? Nothing has been approved yet because since the discovery, it has been quite some time, the concept. Right. So the question is why this ball approach, which seems theoretically so nice, why that isn't um, being used? And so there are, uh, the scientific term for this ball is a liposome, and there are drugs that use liposomes filled with uh, not RNA, but other things, and that's uh, been approved. But uh, liposomes or these balls are much harder to make than other drugs because the, the way you make them, you get a lot of variability. So, for example, you get different sizes of balls, and the FDA really doesn't like that. Um, and another, another, another limiting thing about these balls is that they generally mostly go to the liver, and they don't go to all tissues. So in TTR amyloidosis, actually the liver is where this protein gets produced, the mutant protein. And so you want to target the liver. But um, in many cases, the balls won't go to other organs, or you have to change the composition of the ball, the chemistry. And that's been very difficult for scientists to do. Okay, if we don't have any more questions, I'd like to thank you all for coming, and let's give a big round of applause for our three speakers. <laughs> Sorry, we, we'll, let me wrap up and then we'll take your question before everyone leaves, since I'm already up here. Um, I want to remind you that we are going on a lab tour. Well, they're going on a lab tour. We have room for three more people. It is in George Church's lab where Dima works on some of the stuff he talked about. Dima has also reminded me that George Church was recently on the Colbert Report a few days ago, so you might have seen him there. Um, so if you're going on the lab tour, we'll leave at about 10 after 9. Please hand in your surveys up front when you're finished, and we hope to see you again next week for Living Foods, the microbiology of food and drink. Uh, Thank you. You can uh, watch it. It's online. Uh, he got on the Colbert Report because he did a lot of cool things scientifically, but he's also promoting a book. <laughs>